Well, welcome to the Friday Transportation Seminar. And I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Professor Emeritus Ken Duker. He's been busy in his retirement, and he's here today to uh, give us some evidence of his activity post uh, PSU. So we're really glad to have you back, Ken. And just make sure your microphone is on. Thank you, Rob. Uh, I really enjoyed coming to speak to this group. Uh, I started the transportation seminar a number of years ago, and then Rob Bertini and Jennifer Dill, now John, have picked it up and really formalized it, and I made it a lot better, and including in the webcasting part of it. So uh, it's, that's a pleasure to see something you were involved in early uh, grow and prosper. So thank you very much, Rob, and on that. I'm, as, after retirement, I moved up to the Seattle area frankly, to be closer to my grandchildren. But once there, of course, I got involved with things. And one of the things I got involved with was uh, issues in the local community where I live, at Kirkland, Washington. I'll tell you about Kirkland <coughs> for orientation purposes. But the purpose here is not to tell war stories or the emphasis upon the case study. The case study is used to illuminate more general principles and lessons learned that hopefully can be applied elsewhere. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things that I was involved with when I was an active faculty member was a study sponsored by the Transit Cooperative Research Program. Uh, the project was titled something like Parking Strategies to Improve Transit Ridership, something to that effect. And <clears throat> Well, we, one of the things we learned in that project was that it's difficult to create parking marketplaces where they don't exist or where they don't occur naturally. So what, we've, what we observe today is that most parking markets exist in central cities of downtown. And not too many suburban locations, suburban downtowns, have what you would call as a, as a parking marketplace. That is where they charge for parking. And I'll be talking about one such place, Kirkland, Washington, that fills that bill. And what we learned in that project is that it's difficult to create those parking marketplaces where they don't naturally occur. And <clears throat> So it's a difficult policy knob to turn. You can't say, well, let's increase transit ridership by upping the parking charges. It's just it, uh, a little more complicated than that. So I've been serving, uh, currently serving, as vice chair of the Parking Advisory Board in the city of Kirkland. I have been with this Parking Advisory Board now four years. I've served uh, one year as vice chair, two years as chair, and now one year as vice chair again. Uh, we have term limits on, on officers in the board. So what I'd like to do is, is talk for a moment about the role of parking uh, in, in transportation planning. Well, we know mode choice is a function of the characteristics of the trip origin, relative costs of travel, and the characteristics of the trip destination. And one of the major determinants one of the major trip destination characteristics is the cost of parking. And that's been proven time and time again in the literature as cost of parking is a major determinant of mode choice. And, uh, but yet we've also found that it's very difficult to charge for parking outside of downtowns of central cities. Why is it so difficult? Well, there's a lack of mixed use Oftentimes in the suburbs, office and shopping centers are separate and it's kind of easy to bundle the cost of parking with the building or with the shopping center. So the leases of the offices or leases of the retail include essentially the cost of parking and is provided free and is viewed as a, as a, a, a benefit uh, that is conferred upon those shoppers and users. And people like uh, Don Shoup have talked about uh, cashing out of free parking, mainly in shopping, in office developments. And that has had some success, but some 
uh, administrative and logistic and legal difficulties as well. And the second reason is uh, why is it so difficult is suburbia has developed in the era of the automobile. There's ample parking and the cost of parking, as I say, is folded into the lease. Now that's true in, except in old town locations. Now, so if you view a suburban center, uh, and I'll describe it, Kirkland fits this, it's uh, an old town that is trying to survive in a, in a, in a growing suburb. And it has what we call legacy buildings, uh, buildings without on-site parking, one-story strip of one-story downtown uh, buildings. So you might think of Oregon City or Hillsboro as examples in the local area of a suburban uh, downtown with a number of legacy buildings and, but, and without on-site parking. And then also there, any new development in these suburban areas have to comply with suburban style parking requirements that are set up more for strip development, strip mall developments, uh, where it requires you know one space per uh, 300 square feet of retail, or one space for 400 square feet of of retail, and so. But those are a bit onerous in these old downtowns, and it may not be appropriate where you have more mixed use and more opportunities for shared parking. Now, as I say, I'm going to use as a case study um, Kirkland. And so I'm going to, first of all, talk about some of the characteristics of parking in, in Kirkland and that are fairly typical in these suburban downtowns. Uh, the, first of all, the commuting, uh, there's not much uh, commuting that is uh, subject to, to transit. Uh, where, trans where parking is free, transit use is very low. So most of your suburban downtowns don't have a high proportion of transit use. Uh, shopping, uh, they find it difficult to charge for parking when competing centers do not. And they often, even in downtown Kirkland, tries to compare itself to a competing shopping center when it probably shouldn't. They should be uh, comparing themselves to another old style downtown. And we have found it difficult to regulate employees from using the parking on street, leaving none for the shoppers. And I'll have more to talk about on that lady later. And without a parking revenue stream, it's difficult to finance new parking supply. And uh, the answer appears to be simple, charge for parking. But as I'll repeat again and again, it's a difficult policy mob, knob to, to turn. There's a resistance to parking charges. Um, I'm sure you would find it difficult to go to a shopping center or to a suburban center and be faced with a parking charge. Uh, so outside of central city downtowns, parking charges are quite unusual, and they really only are at airports, universities, and other major activity centers. Uh, are there situations where you can create a marketplace for parking where you can charge for parking. And it's rarely used in the shopping districts of cities or in suburban downtowns. And when I say shopping districts of cities, that would be like, say, uh, Northwest uh, 23rd here in Portland or uh, Hawthorne or some of those outlying shopping districts, Westmoreland, are examples of, uh, and I, I think the only one, at least uh, as of five years ago when I last looked, uh, only Lloyd District do you have parking meters or parking charges. You don't, you don't yet, I know they were talking about them in, in Hawthorne in Northwest 23rd, but that, that was all talk at the time and they weren't able to institute it. Is that still true? Okay. Uh, and in Seattle, they've had a little more success in the city of Seattle of charging for parking in the outlying shopping district. So if you go to Ballard or Capitol Hill or University District, you will find parking charges there. But outside of that, in the suburban areas, none. Uh, and so what we're facing with in Kirkland, it's difficult to be the first suburban downtown to price parking on Seattle's east side. And 
as I will say again and again, it's difficult to create a parking marketplace by policy where it does not occur naturally. Now, the outline of my case study presentation, first of all, where is Kirkland in Seattle area? I want to give you some orientation on that. I want to talk about that this is a, a parking's been a downtown problem for since 1968 when was, I first found uh, evidence of it being uh, mentioned. Uh, we have had an attempt to regulate employee parking, a program called Park Smart was created in 1997 that I'll talk about. Uh, in 2003, there was a parking study, and that led to the creation of the Parking Advisory Board, a move to market-based pricing, of, uh, and, a, and to build new parking supply downtown. Those were the, the mandates. So our Parking Advisory Board essentially has a mandate to move to market-based pricing and to create more in and create more parking supply. Uh, implementation issues have been something else again. Uh, there's been a resistance to pricing of parking. There's been uh, difficulties with financing the new parking supply. Everybody would like to have it, the federal government or the state government, to buy them a parking garage. Well, that isn't likely to happen. And then I'd also like to talk about a study we did about the effect of pricing and the location of parking. We used a stated preference experiment that varied price, walk distance, search time, time limit, and level of fine on the choice of the type of parking. And I'll talk about some of the results of that. First of all, well, you can't even find Kirkland, downtown Kirkland, on this map. It's not a urban center under the Seattle metropolitan regional planning process. Kirkland exists here on Lake Washington, directly west of Redmond, directly north of Bellevue, essentially at the point where the uh, marker here indicates. So it's the small, it's not a major activity, it's not a major urban center, but it is a very vital, vital area. Uh, you, you see it again here, it's, you have a major center of Bellevue, Kirkland, or Redmond, a place called Totem Lake, which is a bunch of strip malls uh, that they're trying to make into more, uh, more coherent. And the city of, or city of downtown Kirkland is right there. And it doesn't, and it exists within the market shadow of two major centers of Bells, Bellevue and Redmond, so it can't really attract national uh, retail outlets. Uh, they're prohibited usually from locating within five miles of an existing uh, store. So you can't get a, another Crate and Barrel. You can't get another Chico's store in downtown Kirkland because they exist in, uh, in, in Belf, Bellevue or in uh, uh, Redmond Town Center. Now, the, pri the crown jewel of downtown Kirkland is Marina Park. Marina Park is, so it's a downtown that's located right on the lake. And part of its advantage is that location of Lake, of its existence on Lake Washington. Here's another site of this same park. This moorage here is not permanent moorage, but it's more for day and weekend use. People pull in to Kirkland and then go out to dinner or buy more provisions, or just live on their boat for the weekend. And then this is a tour boat. Uh, the Argosy Lines runs out along the lake, and his main attraction is going by Bill Gates' house. And then you see in the skyline over here, the tall buildings of Seattle downtown across Capitol Hill. And the University of Washington is located across this ridge. So that gives you a little more of the orientation to where Kirkland is in the Seattle region. Now, downtown Kirkland exists in, with a lot of retail, ground floor retail, and condos above. So a lot of the new development is ground floor retail, condos above, intermixed with the old buildings, old one-story buildings. 
And here's an example of a big condo behind uh, and on top of, so to speak, some retail. Uh, this is a picture looking south across downtown with a row of condos, a row of condos in the background, and a hole in the middle. We have a donut uh, downtown. You got the high density around it and really low density in the middle with these <laughs> legacy buildings. And these legacy buildings are these one story, two, one, one or two story buildings with no parking, all built together, as you often see in, 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 uh, in old downtowns, whether they're suburban or freestanding old towns. <clears throat> Here's a, a shot of, uh, air shot of downtown Kirkland, which we were looking at down in here with the marina park on the lake, another park here, and a shopping center called Kirkland Park Place here that is subject to, is, is slated to be redeveloped at a much higher density, and I'll have more to talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, here's a map of the same, essentially the same axis we were looking at, kind of southwest <coughs> uh, of Kirkland downtown. The legacy downtowns area is in here with this uh, <clears throat> lakefront park and in this other park here. And there are <coughs> uh, two parking lots publicly owned here, Lakeshore Plaza, Lake and Central, and then one parking garage that serves a library in this park area, and then this uh, shopping center that's subject to redevelopment. So right now we have about as much retail in this shopping center as we do in this legacy downtown, but they're going to essentially quadruple the retail and, and double the office space here the red indicates those what we call opportunity sites. These are the sites that are large enough to redevelop with uh, under the existing zoning and, and financial um, situation. So these are what we call opportunity sites. Now, in 1948, uh, Bellevue Shopping Center opened. And a former mayor of Kirkland was quoted in his book, The City Comes of Age. Kirkland's rather seedy looking downtown held tight to its quaintness and potential in the face of shifting consumer shopping interests. And whereas Bellevue essentially became an edge city, and this is a picture of Bellevue and those are all the construction cranes, this is about a year old picture now, downtown Bellevue has about as much office space as downtown Portland. It is one of the premier edge cities and it also has a very, very large regional shopping center. So it has essentially sopped up all the development potential, a good part of it on the east side, leaving Kirkland by, and Kirkland by choice, it remained, it wanted to remain small and quaint. But now they're wondering whether that was the right thing. So we have to think of Kirkland in terms of the competing centers uh, in a, on Seattle's east side. So we have Kirkland, the old town, and Kirkland Park Place, the shopping center, that's now going to be redeveloped. We have Old Bellevue, which is smaller than the old downtown of Kirkland, and Bellevue Square, which is very, very large. Uh, old Redmond, which is primarily strip development, and Redmond Town Center, another shopping center. And then we have condo development that first occurred in Kirkland, then in Bellevue, and now in Redmond. So Kirkland was kind of the first to get the, the condo development of those centers, but kind of last in terms of retail. Now, ParkSmart, I mentioned, this is the regulatory way to regulate employees from using downtown public parking lots and downtown streets. So downtown employees are prohibited to park on street in downtown or in the city owned lots. And employees must register, employers must register their employees and their cars 
as part of the business license. And the employee section of the parking garage uh, is created so they have a place to park. But ParkSmart is very costly to, and difficult to administer. It costs about $100,000 a year in enforcement, and there's about half the parking garage debt and it's operating in maintenance that you can attribute to the ParkSmart program. And there's much abuse of the program. People, there's no incentive really for them to uh, to register or be wanting to register or to keep their registration up to date. And you know how often people turn over cars and employees uh, turn over in restaurant business and so on. So it is a nightmare from a regulatory approach to try to uh, regulate employees' use of city-owned space uh, by means of regulation. So that's one of the driving forces toward creating a marketplace. So what happens is that these map of downtown again, the green is in the case on street parking where employees are prohibited to park and where supposedly left open for shoppers. And this is the downtown, one of the downtown lots. Here's the other downtown lot. And here's that library parking garage. And then so employees can go out into these. They are encouraged to go out into the neighborhood and spill over. And of course, that creates problems too. Well, now the last part then of the case study, and then I'll move into more parking issues. The 2003 parking study was done by a Portland consultant. Uh, uh, and, and Rick Williams. Uh, and th that instituted the market-based planning approach and the emphasis upon financing new parking supply, and as I mentioned, creating the Parking Advisory Board. In 2004, they took those two city-owned lots and made them half free and half pay, which, uh, and that was a kind of a compromise to get it get it approved and not without too much opposition. And the, it, the thought was that the half pay would create more turnover, and uh, and and uh, better manage those lots. And that created a lot of confusion on the parts of the people parking. You know, which they didn't read the signs and were getting tickets for parking. Uh, in the pay part, and they thought it was free, and so on. And so uh, in 2007, we proposed to make the lots fully pay, and that was defeated by a process that we, we went out to the, I was on the board at this time. I wasn't on the board when they did the first 2004. In the 2007, we went out with a proposal in a kind of a town meeting. What to make the lots fully pay. And a lot of the merchants came and spoke against this. And we listened to them, but we proceeded anyway. Well, the merchants went around us. They went directly to the city council. And, uh, and, and the city council overturned this and defeated it, so to speak. And so in just this past spring, uh, just two months ago, we have implemented fully pay lots in the evening only. Because we have a very unusual downtown that it, one thing I didn't mention, I'll mention now, is that our downtown Kirkland is mainly an evening town. It's the bars and the restaurants constitute the major attraction for people and vehicles downtown. So instead of uh, charging for parking during the day, we're charging for parking from 5 to 9 p.m. And that has been, and we got that essentially accepted by giving back. Those lots are free then up until 5 o'clock, but with a three-hour time limit. Now, here's some data of occupancy. This is on-street occupancy for an August. And August is probably the peak, the nicest time of the year in Seattle. So that's when most people come to downtown Kirkland. And you, what you see here is that the occupancy is high in the noon period, drops off 
during the mid-afternoon and then comes back in the evening. And so this, this, this defeat of, uh, of the thing in 2007 forced us to look at this occupancy data a lot closer. And so we did, and we noticed that, you know, we had this lull in the afternoon, and we kind of ignored the peak in the, in the uh, noontime period and said, okay, let's charge in the evening. So this is on street. Here's one of the lots, Lake Street lot. Same thing occurring here, but remember now we had free and pay. So free is pink and pay is green. So what were happening, of course, most people were preferring to park in the free and not in the pay during the day, but in the evenings they were full. This lot was full all the time, all spaces. And here is seasonal. You look at the season. The, again, the yellow indicates the summer months. And this is over several years in this Lakeshore Plaza lot, showing essentially in the summer that lot is full. And again, one of the, the rules of parking is that when parking exceeds 85%, occupancy exceeds 85% of capacity, you should raise the price. Uh, and so that's one of our measures we look at is this 85% uh, rule. But again, uh, the green indicates, you know, February, March period, and there's not much, uh, much demand for parking in downtown Kirkland in this, in the winter. And then the, uh, the more brown or gold tone are the, the, uh, the fall, which is kind of somewhere in between. But so we have a very seasonal downtown. We have a downtown that's not an eight to five downtown because there's really not much office uh, activity down there. And here's a picture of, of, of the Lake and Central lot that is now fully paid during the evening and free during the day. And here's one of the pay stations down at the uh, Lakeshore Plaza lot. And here's one of the signs that explains it's three hour free parking during the day from 9 to 5, and it's pay parking uh, from 5 to 9 p.m. And again, if you, the sign says returning after 5, you better you know, pay for that portion after 5 o'clock. Well, what, I, what we have discovered as a parking advisory board is the importance of outreach to the stakeholders of downtown. Uh, we got a buy-in for pay parking in the evening, but with a give back of free parking in the daytime. Uh, the stakeholders wanted to make sure that new parking revenue is earmarked for new parking supply, but that at the same time we don't price on-street parking until there's a commitment for this new parking supply. So they didn't, the stakeholders didn't want to see us just institute parking and say, well, we'll get new supply sometime in the future. They wanted to see evidence of new supply before they signed off. We also found in this that there's no logical site for a freestanding parking garage. Those sites of the Lake and Central and the Lakeshore Plaza parkings, existing publicly owned space, uh, were not really suited for a freestanding parking garage. And so instead, uh, the intent is to partner with developers to buy or lease a floor of public parking space. And to do that, we need to have a contingency financing plan. In order for a developer to agree to build an extra floor of parking, they would like to uh, not have to wait on the city. So the city has to be ready. There's a readiness issue here. Uh, other factors? Well, there's a a process going on right now by the city planning department to update the downtown plan. They have a downtown advisory committee uh, that, whose focus is retail and who keep emphasizing the importance of parking for retail and, uh, and that you should, and the consultants they brought in have all said you should price your on-street parking, you shouldn't give that away. Uh, you need to create turnover, you need to manage it. Uh, so, you know, again, then they look to the Parking Advisory Board to uh, come up with that new supply 
and uh, to make those changes. Uh, there's also within the city of Kirkland downtown area very controversial redevelopment proposals. Two of them recently have been defeated where height was a major issue. Uh, Kirkland doesn't want to become like Bellevue, doesn't want to have office towers, and so, and, and every existing condo doesn't want another one built of equal height. And this redevelopment of Park Place that I mentioned, there's 1.2 million square feet of office and uh, 0.6 million square feet of retail being proposed. And that will have a major impact and they're going to have 3,500 parking spaces in structures at that development. And they have a traffic management plan that calls for pricing and other mechanisms uh, to uh, to really manage the traffic there and to reduce the number of trips by by auto. So these are all pressures uh, that are changing downtown Kirkland and um, and it's a moving target so to speak because the plan hasn't been updated or completed yet and yet we're trying to move ahead with uh, recommendations on parking. Now how do we go about financing new parking supply? Well, we get among the stakeholders a, a good notion that we need to allocate costs among benefited parties in principle, but when you start getting more specific, then people start protecting their own interests. Uh, we've identified the benefited parties as the general public via general revenue bonds, the general public, because downtown Kirkland is an attraction for an awful lot of special events and those park visitors, uh, so that people come in downtown for other things than shopping, but once downtown, number them shop or, or have their meal downtown. Uh, there's also those properties and businesses within walking distance of a new parking garage, uh, and so we'd use some kind of parking benefit district which is a little more flexible in the state of Washington than a local improvement district, but they're very similar. And then we have the users of the parking system via parking charges, and which would pay for parking revenue bonds. Now, we're in the process now of, of trying to complete the process of outreach to these benefited parties to try to get them to buy into uh, a mechanism to allocate costs And as I mentioned at the outset, we, we, we saw the need to try to estimate the impacts of, of different parking management proposals, principally where to locate a garage and how to price it. So we used, since we didn't have any experience with, or very much experience with parking prices, we used a stated preference survey to estimate those effects of parking uh, alternatives that do not exist. So we varied price, walking distance, search time, time limit, and level of, fly, level of fine on choice of parking for on street, city lot, new parking garage, or a free but distant on street parking. And by that, uh, we meant to try to get a handle on the spillover problem. That was kind of a default option. So, I'm sorry, this is a little bit hard to read, but these are the options. Are you going to pick an on-street location given some level of price, some walk distance, some level of search time? Those were the main things that affect people's choice of where to park. Or, and, or are you going to pick the surface, again, with manipulating the price, the walk distance, the search time, or the new garage, which is the one that doesn't exist yet, again varying the, uh, those parameters, or you're going to go to a free but more distant location where you, it's always free, it's always a long ways away. Uh, and so that we designed an experiment then that manipulated those variables and asked people to make a choice. We we observed vehicle lice, vehicles parked downtown. 
<coughs> recorded their license plate. <coughs> he got their address. Department of Motor Vehicles. However, this was an internet-based survey, and we, they had to plug in the link. They had to type in the link. And so we had a very low response rate to this mail survey, um, mail-out survey, asking them to, to do the survey online. So we had to enrich this sample with persons from neighborhood associations where we had an email address and we could send them a, uh, an appeal to participate in our survey, and they could just click on the link and take the survey. So we increased our response rate, but it's not as representative as we would like, and we can't really estimate uh, proportions of our choice. So they limited our utility of the survey somewhat. And here's an example of some of the results. And this says, okay, if you manipulate the on-street parking cost from free to 50 cents an hour, to a dollar an hour, to two dollars an hour, how many people would pick on street parking? Well, as you see, there's people are sensitive to price, and the proportion of them that would pick on street parking declines as the price goes up. Well, where do they go? Well, some of them go on to the new surface, uh, to the existing surface lots. Some would go into this new parking garage, and some would go to the free, more distant parking, that is, they would uh, choose to walk rather than pay. And some would not make the trip at all. That's the competing center argument that you would be pushing by a few price, you're going to push people out of downtown altogether. So it's in a real, it's, you know, this is what the merchants would argue, and it's, to a certain extent it's real. Now, as they say, because of our representative, the actual proportions on here aren't very accurate, but at least I think you get a sense of the impact of what happens if you price on-street parking. Now, the other thing we I did here, and I don't have a slide on, is able to show, okay, if I pick out who is more willing to pay for parking and who is not, generally people who older probably higher income, are looking for convenience, are more willing to play, pay. Those who are younger, more able to walk, or perhaps less able. So there is, you're also able to, with this kind of experiment, look at who responds and, and what we did, I think in the, well, I'm going to get to it in one more time. Here, I just varied, again, on-street search time. Search time of zero to one minutes or one to two minutes, two to four minutes, four to six minutes, again, isn't quite as important as price, but search time does affect your choice of whether you do on, if it's very high for, you know, if it's very congested or very uh, long search, longer search times for on-street parking, do then push people into these other uh, parking destinations as well but has a less impact than price. Now, here is an example of, uh, that I wanted to show you of difference between males and females. Both males are a little more sensitive to price than are females, and those that then are more likely, males are more likely to go into a parking garage than are females. And I think this is a safety security issue and I think you, if you design a, a parking garage, you really have to be sensitive to that if you want uh, them, it to be used. And uh, the data really show this. Uh, we also, if you have free on-street parking and pay to park off-street, uh, you, you essentially don't get as... On-street parking, uh, it becomes the preferred location, and the new parking garage uh, suffers as a result. But if you pay to park on-street, or you, and you pay to park bo off-street both, then you can divert more of your uh, your patronage to off-street locations, both survey surface lots and to the parking 
uh, new parking garage. And of course, you do still have some diversion. Uh, people are going to walk into the neighborhoods where it's free to park. And we tried to also look at whether you locate the parking garage kind of close in versus farther out. And of course, you get the expected results there uh, in terms of the new parking garage is going to draw less if you move it further out than if closer in. That's rather obvious. But uh, it was a good, good technique to get people to think about where to locate the garage. Uh, final thing with final result of our survey, stated preference survey, is this what I call willingness to pay an explanation of cruising. And what we're able to uncover from our data is that people are more inclined to drive and search for parking than they are to park farther and walk. And that was that's evidenced by a 1,200-foot walk is equal to a parking cost of 95 cents. And that's not a universal law. This is a law or kind of a, a law in Kirkland right now where you don't really have much of pricing. Uh, you'd have a different number in Portland, downtown Portland. Anyway, uh, while a search time of five minutes is equal to a parking cost of 45 cents, roughly half. And yet it, walking 1,200 feet takes nearly five minutes on average. So the, the conclusion is that it's, uh, it's twice as, as perception is of people is twice as costly. Uh, walking is twice as costly as a search time of five minutes or 1,200-foot walk time. So and that explains cruising. People are generally more likely to want to cruise around the block looking for a parking space than they are to go three blocks away and park and walk for the same amount of time. So five minutes they spent cruising rather than five minutes of walking. Now, conclusions. I got two sets of conclusions, two slides on conclusions here. Now let's try to bring this back into uh, what have we learned? What's transferable from this experience that I've gone through in Kirkland? One is rather obvious. It's providing shared parking in suburban downtowns with legacy buildings is difficult. Um, those legacy buildings are... Uh, they, they generate a revenue that is difficult to, to improve by redevelopment, particularly if density constraints are, and Kirkland height limits are low. And uh, yet it's, uh, they want more parking, but uh, it's, it's difficult to provide. It, design and location of parking has proved to be a challenge. It's, uh, to, you, you want parking that's well integrated with the development, yet it's difficult to integrate development with legacy. Uh, it's difficult to design parking uh, to serve legacy buildings. And we've kind of all concluded that charging for on-street parking is needed to improve traffic management to foster improved mode choice, to finance parking supply, and to eliminate this regulatory approach that is used in ParkSmart to, uh, to manage the parking of employees. And uh, we have to be sensitive to the need to address parking spillover into the neighborhoods with maybe a residential parking permit program. And where we are right now, it's, it's proving contentious uh, about allocating costs of new parking among the benefited parties. We have found that the planning process uh, is, is really important here. I, I come at this from my own planning experience as a, more from a technical analysis perspective, yet realizing that, that planning is a balance of technical analysis and community and citizen participation or process facilitation. I think all those in, in the planning profession realize that uh, this balance uh, is, 
is really, I think, what makes planning unique uh, and uh, is, is our expertise, is our ability to do technical analysis in the context of, uh, of a participatory process. Yet, uh, we, we discovered that stakeholder participation without facilitation uh, failed us in the first instance when we tried to institute parking. And that facilitation alone has failed to address important issues. We went through, we hired a facilitator for our stakeholder process. And this facilitator wanted, anytime we had a controversy, wanted to sweep it aside and move on to areas where we could achieve consensus. And so the important issues didn't get addressed. And so we've, it's forced us to come back and deal with both substance and facilitation. And that's where we are now in this process. We're going to be meeting our stakeholders again to, to re-examine and to restudy these parking issues. And it's important and one, because when they do that, they generally come to the right kind of efficiency and equity considerations. But without it, they don't get to that point. So we get, uh, we get the stakeholders to, to agree upon the principles that move us in the direction of efficiency and equity. But when we get to who benefits and who pays, then they often move back to their special interest perspectives of trying to protect their special interest. And, and the best example of this right now is that the stakeholders for the downtown property owners are saying, well, the economy is not very good right now. We can't pay for parking. It should be, it's more of a general benefit. So it, um, they're resisting uh, they're resisting uh, paying uh, their share, so to speak. They, then, and I thought the developers were essentially had shared this view as well. But then I got the an email from a developer here recently saying, "Hey, these legacy building owners are not." Uh, pulling their own weight. They, they want us, everybody else, to pay for their parking. So it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. So I guess my general uh, concluding uh, point in here, and I'd like to get some discussion of this, is that uh, parking is not an easy policy tool to work with. It gets very political very quickly, uh, but there is, uh, when you do get the stakeholders involved in the process and who have a stake in the, in the downtown, they, they generally will come to the right conclusions, but uh, then the, the final step of getting them to uh, getting a payment or getting a payment scheme is, is more difficult. So uh, I'll conclude here and, and ask for uh, some comment and questions. Open it up. Remember, I guess you're supposed to push the button if you'd like to speak. Yes. Um, have you put any thought into, or do you think this might be a viable option, is instead of kind of increasing demand, because it seems like whenever you try to add more parking, there's never going to be enough parking. You're going to have to keep more parking. So you start to try to facilitate that with um, a fee structure, but have you thought about, um, or if would this work in Kirkland, is instead make a policy issue where you eliminate um, parking requirements for new developments and redevelopments? So that puts yes. more money on the, to the builder? That's a good question because we are, in fact, asking the planning department to re-examine the parking requirements. We do think the suburban parking requirements are not suitable for downtown areas where you do have more mixed use. You do have, and you do want to do shared parking. So uh, uh, we are examining the, the parking uh, requirements under zoning. Yes, in a red shirt. 
Yes, you. Yeah. I had a question about uh, a couple of goals you had there and the conclusions for pricing parking were to uh, finance new parking supply, but also to encourage alternative modes, which kind of seemed contradictory to me in terms of kind of saying you want to create parking supply but keep the spots empty by re reducing auto trips. So how do those jive? The parking demand is, uh, is as I mentioned, is very seasonal and time of day oriented. So there are there are a number of of, of times of which uh, we are going to have excess supply. Uh, but the parking and the parking price, we're now charging a dollar an hour, and it's really not a price that uh, will keep it down to eighty five. Will knock the occupancy down to the eighty five percent rule. If you really wanted to implement the and achieve the 85% rule, you'd have to charge more than a dollar an hour. Yet politically, we're not going to be able to do that, at least at the outset. Um, now, did I answer your other part, your question? Oh. I guess how, you can say the traffic management plan. Oh. Like, how, how does parking supply figure into that? The. Uh, the shopping center developer I mentioned is really address that issue because they are faced, they want to right size the parking. They don't want to build too much, yet they want to have enough. So they're working on pricing and on incentives for workers to use other modes in the auto to try to manage that. And as a single developer, they have a better handle on the parking management can control more aspects of it than we can in the downtown. But we have the same issue there. Uh, I, one place I didn't mention but on, our, on the map was a location of a transit center. There is a transit center in the downtown that, uh, and that, that's a sticky one. Right now, we're not allowing the users of the transit center to park in that library garage, which is right next to it. But if we move to a pricing of both the garage and the on-street parking, we can essentially open that up. Two employees, two transit riders, and these are transit riders mainly going to the university and to the downtown. So it, again, there's a lot of uh, advantages to a pricing strategy rather than a regulatory strategy of opening up the parking and making it available to whoever wants to use it, willing to pay the price. And then we can be in a position of adjusting that price and making the, bringing balance of uh, supply and demand. Excuse me, right there. Uh, you're talking about pushing the, like, the people that work for the different businesses that got to the residential parking areas. I guess. Sorry, but okay. My question is like, what, what sort of plan do you have with uh, dealing with the overspill of the parking in the residential areas, and uh, like, how do you, I guess, combat that towards the residents with their loss of parking in front of their residence? Do you have a plan towards dealing with that issue? When I lived in Portland, I lived in the Homestead neighborhood, which is uh, the neighborhood where Oregon Health Sciences University is, and we have a they had a real spillover problem there. Uh, it was so bad some people would, some residents would uh, rent their driveway or garage space and park on the street because they had uh, the ability to uh, get a residential permit. It exempted them from the two-hour time limit. So what generally happens in the spillover problem is you create a residential parking permit program which allows the residents to park unrestricted, and but takes visitors and puts them on a two-hour limit and presumably keeps the all-day parkers out of that neighborhood. And so that's the general strategy. But again, it's a regulatory strategy. Uh, but any time, and so the solution is to put the parking meters far enough out that the spillover problem gets dissipated with, with fewer problems. But it's always a problem. There's always a boundary problem you have. But residential parking permits are, you know, the, the best thing we have going for us right now 
but they also have their administration and their abuse problems. Yes. Um, looking at the parking uh, issue from other perspective, now increasing the number of public uh, transportations like buses and streetcars going into downtown, would the, how would that impact the demand on parkings? In your central cities, of course, you have a high mode split to transit and anything you do to increase that uh, helps and you can do that by improving the transit or and or by increasing the, the cost of parking. In suburban downtowns uh, like Kirkland and if you would want to you know, take Hillsboro or uh, Gresham or some of your local downtowns as well and this you don't have um, usually that high a proportion of transit ridership uh, because you don't have price parking and you don't have usually a transit that's radiating or oriented uh, to the to those downtowns as much you don't have as, as good a service so you you don't usually get that high and it's not a diff uh, you don't get that transit use that um, that you can uh, work to to improve. Okay. I think uh, it's it's one o'clock, so we okay. need to close. But I'm sure Ken will be available to take some additional questions. I would like to remind. The, uh, remind everyone that next week uh, Jeff Mapes from the Oregonian will be talking about his new book actually, Pedaling Revolution, How Cyclists Are Changing American Cities. So let's uh, thank uh, Ken Duger for his great presentation.